In the geospatial track, we've got a uh, special presentation in this session uh, from Jim Hughes of CCRI um, last year in the geospatial track. Uh, Jim showed up, uh, you know, he's been working in uh, this area for a while and uh, came to ApacheCon last year and and uh, not only blew us away, but also, uh, you know, said, hey, uh, I'd like to get involved. So, uh, you know, kudos to Jim uh, on organizing the uh, track with me and uh, even more kudos to his work, this um, work on Geomesa and uh, uh, location tech and the like. And uh, you know, if you don't say spatial pulling curves somewhere, and we're going to take away that topology uh, doctor from you, buddy. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the introduction. Um, so George and I have been uh, the organizers for this track for this year. And uh, George has done a lot of the uh, heavy lifting, um, and a lot of thanks goes to uh, Rich and other folks who have helped uh, move the whole thing online uh, with the current situation here in 2020. Uh, so I'm uh, grateful to be able to speak at ApacheCon again. Uh, I will talk about space filling curves, so I do get to keep my uh, PhD in math. Um, as a little bit of a background about myself, I work at a company called CCRI where I'm the director of open source programs. And for the last eight years, I've been working uh, on geospatial software that lives on the JVM. Um, some of that work is based on Location Tech Geomesa, which I'll talk about. Um, there's a project called SF Curve uh, that uh, we got started a little bit ago uh, to uh, be a common place to do some of the uh, indexing that we'll talk about later. I've also been contributing to um, uh, JTS uh, to help with some of the releases and things like that. Uh, and uh, GeoTools and GeoServer are projects uh, from OSGeo that uh, I've worked with quite a bit. Uh, so we're talking about uh, big geospatial data and uh, we should clarify what type and what volume. So uh, let's state our problem. We wanna figure out how to handle uh, big geospatial data for a second. And the first thing we wanna do is be clear about what sort of data uh, we could mean by that. Uh, when we talk about geospatial data, uh, it can come in about three different modalities, uh, at least as I think about it. Uh, we could talk about vector data, which is points, lines, and polygons, and uh, attributes associated with them. Uh, from there, we could also have raster data. Um, if you wanted to be precise about raster data, you should think of it as a grid of data where for every a uh, little grid cell, you have an array of uh, values. Uh, commonly, that array of values is uh, red, green, and blue channels, and then that gives you a pretty picture. Um, so this can cover imagery. Uh, it can cover uh, lots of different things that we could gather, uh, Earth observation data, or it could just be a pretty map that we've made from some other data set. Um, there's also point cloud data, which um, as we've gone from vector data through raster data to point cloud data, point cloud data is definitely the heaviest, it's the largest in volume. Um, and um, yeah, um, we're, we're talking about vector data today. Um, so a lot of what we're gonna focus on is just uh, points, lines, and polygons. Uh, I'm gonna leave the uh, other uh, types of data for experts in those modalities. Um, so we should talk about how much data you have to have before you've got uh, big data. Um, there are two uh, data sets that I'm gonna say are kind of a little bit on the smaller side or maybe medium data instead of big data. Um, the first one to talk about is uh, GDELT. It's a uh, database of events that has been uh, computed by uh, performing NLP on uh, basically just worldwide news sources uh, for the past, you know, almost 40 years. And it's got, um, I, I didn't check the exact size recently, but 200 
25, 250 million records in it. Um, and so everything that's happened since, uh, you know, uh, 1980 till now um, is, is not even a billion events. Um, so that's moderately, that's, we're not getting too big. Um, I double checked, and if we look at OpenStreetMap, uh, the worldwide um, coverage of that. So a second ago, GDELT was everything that's happened uh, over the course of history or recent history. Uh, OSM is uh, everywhere where we might want to go and have some information about it. Uh, the entire change set looks like it's only a few, is uh, 140 some odd gigabytes. And so uh, that can fit on a thumb drive. So we haven't quite hit um, big where uh, we can, we really need to dig into some of these techniques that these top level Apache projects are going to give us. Um, so as a next example where things do get much uh, larger, if we start to talk about um, data that comes from some sort of sensor moving through space and time, um, that gets us to quite a bit more data. Uh, some examples of this would be AIS or ADSB or mobility data. Uh, to take each of those in turn, AIS is a signal that's broadcast by uh, all the ships uh, that are at sea. Um, so there's some regulation that if you're a uh, ship is over a certain size, you need to be broadcasting where you are. Some of it's um, to help with collision avoidance. Some of it is to um, help monitor um, if vessels are um, behaving correctly uh, relative to um, international waters, things like that, and respecting those um, uh, zones around fishing or other transport. Similarly, for airplanes, there's ADSB, and um, that's also, you know, used to track, see where uh, airplanes are. And um, our cell phone providers, um, they can triangulate where most of our cell phones are. That information is used by um, any of our cell phone applications that where we uh, click accept to say that it can track our location. Um, these sources can produce uh, millions to billions of records per day. So. Um, if we're talking about that in terms of spatial temporal data, this is where, for me, big data starts to take off. So um, my daily job is to, you know, address this question. How do we handle millions to billions of vector data? And it's typically point data that's coming in every day. And so um, that's kind of my background uh, frame of reference uh, so that you know uh, what I'm talking about today. Um, I want to introduce GeoMesa. Um, we're going to focus a lot on the uh, distributed databases we use and the um, Apache file formats that we use. But as a quick overview about what GeoMesa is, it's a suite of tools for streaming, persisting, managing, and analyzing spatial temporal data at scale. Um, we are open source through the Eclipse Foundation. They've got a uh, sub part of that called Location Tech that GeoMesa is a part of. Um, as we've worked with streaming data, we've integrated with Kafka, and um, there's not much you have to open source around what happens in Storm, uh, but Kafka and Storm are great ways to uh, stream the data. This talk is going to be a lot about how things work for persistence. And so uh, the top line, uh, we're calling out some of uh, the key value databases that we'll drill into a little bit more on the second row. We've got some of the uh, file formats that we'll dig into a little bit more. For data management, uh, we've integrated with Apache NiFi to help uh, move data around uh, the enterprise. So this is a great way to uh, get data into a system. And then if you do need to send it to Kafka and then to uh, one of your distributed databases, uh, NiFi is a really powerful tool for doing that. Um, in terms of analysis, um, Spark is, uh, you know, everyone's favorite uh, thing to go write uh, distributed jobs in at this point. GeoMesa integrates with uh, the Hadoop MapReduce input formats, and that lets you get Spark RDDs and uh, Spark data frames of geospatial data. Uh, once you've got that hooked up, you can use popular uh, notebook technologies to rapidly prototype uh, analytics and uh, go from there. 
if we put this all together, we can have data streaming in. Uh, Geomesa has some additional uh, ETL capabilities that help us uh, map between uh, whatever format uh, your data happens to be in over to uh, some of the OGC standards like simple features as we uh, stream the data through either um, to Kafka so that we can see a live view of what's going on or into distributed databases um, for later historical uh, retrieval and analysis. Um, so I said we're going to drill into uh, this persistence piece a little bit more. So uh, we'll kind of take this top line of distributed databases and then the second line of file formats each in turn. Okay, so whenever we talk about distributed key value stores, um, uh, this is a gross oversimplification of the databases uh, on the right. Um, I think of them as an encyclopedia. Uh, and I, I almost always literally think of the encyclopedia set I had as a kid uh, sitting up on the shelf. Um, if you were talking about the computer science background here, uh, you have what's called a B plus tree. And the data at the end of the day is actually written into uh, um, volumes on disk that would be like pulling off a uh, volume off the shelf. Uh, whenever you've got that encyclopedia, the each volume gets distributed to different um, you know, workers in the cloud, and they're responsible for ans answering questions about their part of it. Um, so that's my kind of anchor point there. Um, the thing that we have to overcome is if we have that distributed uh, key value store, if we just have the same structure that our um, multi-volume dictionary or encyclopedia has, uh, we do need to use uh, space filling curves uh, to do that. Um, so uh, this is my space filling curves in one slide, um, just so that I don't wind up spending uh, the entire talk uh, going on about it. Um, our goal is to come up with a one-dimensional index for data that has uh, more than one uh, dimension. There are a few steps and it's worth separating them out, at least in my opinion, this has helped me think through a lot of it. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to grid up our space. So we've picked whatever projection, longitude, latitude for the world, and we've decided um, that we're gonna grid it up. In this case, we happen to be using a very regular uh, quad tree, um, but if you keep track, that these steps don't have to be done exactly this way. You could see that you have choices. Um, once we've got the grid, we have to figure out an order to put on the grid. Um, the easiest thing you could possibly do, and I've actually seen people do this on a mailing list where they'll say, hey, once we've got this grid, we could interleave uh, the bits about which row and which column you're uh, in, in the grid, we could interleave those. Um, if you do that, you wind up with a um, Morton order curve, a Z order curve. Uh, it's also called a geohash. So the obvious thing that you would do if you just said, hey, I want to um, put my grid cells in order is this. There are also uh, other space filling curves. The Hilbert curve is another good one. Uh, the Z order curve is really quick to compute. Um, as a little plug for why you want to use a library, even though the implementation is literally just interleaving uh, two bit arrays and uh, you, know, you could hand that off to a, uh, you know, first year computer science student to any programmer, there are algorithms that you would wanna have uh, whenever you're going back the other way to say, um, uh, whenever you need to go from a query back to what cells have been touched and what ranges that you wanna work through, uh, some of that is a little more complicated. Um, anyhow, um, there's some other properties that we want um, with our space filling curves around uh, them nesting. That lets us uh, truncate our bit string and then uh, be able to uh, control how fine grain or how coarse our query is. That also helps with a little bit with locality. Um, if you've paid attention in math class, one of the things that they always do, um, if someone comes in uh, on Monday and tells you we're gonna do something for uh, two dimensions, they'll usually come in uh, you know, a week later, a month later, next year, and then say, okay, here's how we do it in three dimensions or four dimensions. Um, all of these things have higher dimensional analogs. 
Uh, one of the things that is really, really interesting here is that as you go to more dimensions, uh, you can realize that space filling curves are effectively uh, finite functions uh, that get composed in certain ways. So uh, as you have higher dimensions, you have more choices than just saying, oh, I need to go, um, I either had to pick team Z-order curve or team Hilbert curve and ask how those go to higher dimensions. You have ways that you could mix and match as you go in higher dimensions. Uh, anyhow, um, since we are talking about both distributed databases and um, the file formats, I want to highlight here that we can either use this to make uh, bit and byte based keys that we can use in our distributed databases, or if we go ahead and come up with a way to take our bit strings and map them into, uh, to do something like base64 and code them or pick another uh, string representation for them, we can use those whenever we're partitioning files. Um, okay, so um, that's the quick caveat that I wanted to say that's gonna make clear that this approach can be used for either. So whenever we're query planning, if we were querying for just the gray rectangle, our it's going to overlap with our underlying grid structure. And this gives us um, a little bit of slop whenever we're talking about uh, what data to actually pull back. There are some options there where we can pull back the additional data and then use something higher up in the uh, stack to go ahead and forget about those points. Or we can apply fine grain filtering if our database will allow us to do that. OK. Um, so the score so far is there was some really nerdy math uh, that we talked about. That let us put our points, lines, and polygons into uh, databases uh, like Accumulo and HBase and Cassandra and Redis. Um, one of the things that we can do in the case of Accumulo and HBase is optimize things that happen on the server side. These optimizations, we don't have them for Cassandra or Redis. Uh, Cassandra and Redis have a little bit uh, smaller and also harder to work with uh, options for uh, pushing down work to, uh, you know, the cluster. But in Accumulo and HBase, uh, we can push down some of the work that we're talking about. So uh, Accumulo has iterators, HBase has filters, and effectively what we can do is, um, if you think about uh, your functional programming, um, you know, that you've, uh, we've all uh, been learning and adopting over the last several years with MapReduce, uh, we can apply a filter and a map step over these key value pairs as they're uh, being scanned. So this lets us apply um, fine grain spatial filtering if we need to do a point and polygon check. It would also let us um, go through and um, check something more careful about the additional attributes that may be associated to the geometry. As a concrete example, I said we might talk about AIS some. If we were looking for tankers that were in a given region for a time period, uh, that spatial temporal uh, constraint can be used against uh, GMACE's Z3 index. That gives us a chance to cut down uh, the amount of data we're asking the database to even consider. And that uh, restriction to various key ranges can be applied across whether we're talking about uh, Redis or Cassandra, as well as um, Accumulo and HBase. Whenever we're talking about uh, filtering for that particular vessel type, in Accumulo and HBase, we can push that down. So the good thing about this is this cuts down on uh, network traffic. If there is um, some uh, work to be done to figure out if the records um, match our constraint. This also distributes the work, so that's uh, useful. At the same time, um, we shouldn't just think of this being a uh, filter step in terms of our uh, functional programming paradigm. We can also transform the data with a map step. Uh, one of the common things you might want to do in a projection is uh, drop off uh, certain columns, and uh, we can do that. So we can return just the subset of columns that's needed either uh, to respond to the particular request, or if we're providing uh, a WMS request where there's going to be a style applied, uh, we can uh, subset down just what we're looking for there. Um, 
as a like weird little side note, if you're ever implementing an Accumulo iterator, don't change the key. Uh, uh, find me later if you want to hear a war story about that. Um, on the server side, we've got filters that we can uh, plug into um, where we can either do a little bit of um, additional filtering around the space filling curves that are used for the keys, or we can apply the GeoTools uh, query language. It's called CQL. We can apply that uh, to pull back exactly the features we're talking about. There are some other specialized ones that uh, fit into finer grain uh, maintenance things or around uh, visibility. Um, so as we're talking about all this work that can be pushed to the distributed database, um, we've, we've seen how we were able to filter and transform the data a little bit. We can also do uh, a reduce, uh, and that gives us a chance to do aggregations. So we can do both of these together. Um, if we do these aggregations, this lets us calculate uh, things like heat maps and statistics uh, very easily. We can also um, create custom data formats. Uh, I won't focus on that one as much uh, in this particular talk. So um, the cool thing here is everything we're talking about uh, works in a single pass over the data, and that single pass is distributed. Um, again, uh, my kind of anchor point for this is imagining that we have our encyclopedia of data. We've passed out the volumes to uh, everyone in the audience, and we're asking uh, each person to look up in their volume and do some part of the work. So if we need to calculate something like a heat map, um, everyone's going to have to return their part of it. Whenever we aggregate the results, then we'll have to style it. Uh, heat maps are cool because if you just return all the points, you get a view that looks like this, where um, it's not very clear. We're, we're somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea, and we just have a whole bunch of noise. If we create a heat map, uh, we can start to see uh, where there are shipping lanes. Things start to pop out a little bit better. Um, the way this is implemented, we... Um, we know what size the user's uh, screen is, where they've made the request, and we can ask for a grid that's that size, and we can ask each server to uh, basically, for each pixel, return a count. At that point, a little um, kernel, Gaussian, something like that is applied uh, to that to smooth it out, and you've got control over that as well. Um, all of this means that uh, we don't have to ship all that data back to GeoServer, and we don't have to send it back to the client. So that heat map could represent um, hundreds of thousands or millions of points, and we're just sending back one small PNG. As another example of uh, this sort of work that we can push down, uh, we can also um, come up with uh, very complicated statistical queries. So. Doing something easy like um, counts or minimum maximum values uh, would be pretty quick to think through, and we would get it right. Um, the thing that's non obvious um, is that there are much more complicated things like descriptive statistics, where you can calculate uh, not just uh, a mean, but also standard deviation and uh, higher order moments uh, like skew and kurtosis. All of that can be calculated in one pass uh, over the uh, data. So that was a really cool thing, uh, as one of my coworkers pointed that out to me. Um, again, the big thing that's happening here is we're asking each um, server for their particular part of the answer. Um, there's something similar in the Spark API. If you've ever seen their uh, user-defined aggregate uh, functions, you get the same sort of uh, capability there. Um, OK. So uh, just before we leave talking about uh, our geospatial databases, uh, I wanted to say a moment or two about some of the cool things about using them in practice. Hey, Jim, you got 10 minutes yes. left in the session. So you got five minutes probably in the Q&A if you want. So. Great. OK, thank you very much. Um, so for geospatial uh, databases, both Accumulo and HBase can use things like AWS's S3. And Azure and Google have equivalents. Uh, this is cheaper than running uh, HDFS using uh, um, 
whatever attached uh, storage the particular cloud vendor has. Uh, GeoMesa 3 has support for um, Accumulo and HBase, both their 1X and 2O lines. So that's something a little bit new there. Um, so let's talk about um, some of the things that we've done with the various uh, vector data formats. So some of the cool uh, things that we have uh, with some of the formats we're going to talk through, some of them have columnar layouts. We've got uh, one of them, Avro, that is a row uh, format. They wind up having tools like dictionary encoding and other compression uh, structures uh, that help us out. Um, and the language interoperability is another uh, cool thing. Um, there is one, one catch. At the minute, uh, none of the types we're talking about out of the box have um, a way to handle any of the vector data uh, a priori. OK, so I'll skip over talking about row versus column layouts. Um, that'll be in the slides if folks are interested later. Apache Arrow is, uh, Avro, sorry, is the odd one out that we're going to talk about here for a moment in that it's row based. Um, this is going to be great. Um, for handling whenever we need to think of uh, our records one off by themselves and also having the schema potentially embedded in a file. Um, Parquet and Orc are going to look fairly similar. Uh, they are both column based, um, and we get uh, some good compression, things like that. Um, yep, yeah, so uh, a lot of the same things are the same there. Arrow is optimized, unlike Work and Parquet, Arrow is optimized for in-memory use. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, that's the probably the key point to say about Arrow. OK, so since these don't have nati native spatial types, we have uh, to figure out how to actually encode the geometries. And um, Avro, since it's the one record-based one, we do we pretty much want to have one field there that's representing the uh, geometry. So we'll use something like uh, well-known text or well-known binary or tiny well-known binary. For the other formats, um, we're going to wind up um, storing our points as a column of x's and a column of y's. And the good thing about that is uh, Orc and Parquet, as they write out their uh, files in multiple chunks, will actually keep track of statistics of that x value and that y value. So that allows for some uh, modest amount of filtering that can happen. Uh, for line strings and multipoints, you can have a column of list of double for x's and a list of y for, um, you know, a list of uh, doubles for the y's. Um, and once you realize you can play that game, you can have a list of lists and a list of list of lists to cover uh, the other types. OK. Uh, in terms of reading and writing, uh, this slide has some information about our um, some of the things there. I'm skipping through some of this a little bit quick to get to a few of the other things. In terms of use cases, um, I want to drill into a little bit of that. For Avro, since each message is its own record, Having it, row, having it be row-based is uh, really useful. Um, we've um, been sending uh, Avro and Cryo uh, to Kafka topics and uh, using that with um, either Storm or things like K-Streams or uh, other technologies to uh, do some uh, good things there. Uh, we're looking into using Confluent Schema Registry to manage the Avro schemas. And we have this Kafka data store that also will read from this topic and keep an in-memory index of what's going on. For Spark, working with Orkin Parquet um, is really great. Um, you don't have to have a database, so that's uh, a nice win there. Um, so that's handy. If you have, if you do have an HBase, merging uh, some of that data with uh, a longer view that's available in something like S3 in Orc or Parquet files is another uh, powerful thing. And Apache Arrow is really handy for doing some of the in-memory things that we are talking about. Um, and this is where we've done a fair bit in um, 
working with web browsers to be able to create histograms and animate points and do things like that in the browser. So um, we can filter through uh, what's happening in an arrow file pretty quickly there. Um, I want to say one or two things about uh, where some of this goes for using these file formats in practice. Afro, since it does have, can have the schema with it, is great for interchange between systems. Uh, Arrow is great for your analysis use cases where you're uh, sharing memory between uh, projects or doing, uh, or between languages or doing something in browser. And Orc and Parquet are going to be great for this data lake uh, storage use case. I said earlier that your space filling curve could generate a string, just the same way that Hive uses partitions uh, where you might put in information about um, you know, the date or other uh, column or data like that to separate out what's happening. You could use uh, any of your space filling curves to generate those same sort of um, uh, strings to represent uh, where the data is instead of when the data is. There's file and block level information in these parquet files and work files. Um, that can let you do some coarse filtering. And if you think through that and also think through some of the sorting, you can pick up some additional um, compression benefits. Uh, a lot of the data that we're talking about in this, in my use cases uh, that I'm really interested in uh, are it's, it's entity-based data. So if you group the data, sort it by a given entity and then sort by time with respect to that, all the data for a particular uh, vessel or airplane would be together. And then um, there's going to be pretty good compression out along a lot of the columns since a lot of the metadata for a vessel doesn't change. Um, that's what I've got. Uh, here's all my contact information. Uh, Geomesa has a uh, Gitter that we're fairly active on. Uh, so feel free to reach out and ask us questions there. Uh, CCRI is pretty much always hiring. Um, to do what we do, we need everything from DevOps to help us um, deploy things to software engineers to help make more of Geomesa and data scientists to analyze what we do. Uh, with that, I'll stop and see what questions there are. Thanks, Jen. Very good. We've got a couple of minutes, three minutes. And I don't see anything in the chat. I encourage people to put their questions in the chat. Now, one thing that occurs to me is uh, the slide, it's not just two, two or so back with respect to kind of your summary on encoding formats, Avro, and Arrow, and uh, first off, I thought it was a really good summary with respect to applications. And, you know, your point here being that uh, these are not natively spatial, they need additional definition. Uh, I know, for example, other groups that have done spatial definitions in Avro. Um, where, you know, how should we, I want to say standardize, uh, you know, how we do spatial and Avro Arrow in Parquet? Uh, any thoughts about that? Good question. Um, so I, yeah, um, I think that's tough because um, I could certainly see um, options for just the same way that JSON is separate from GeoJSON, having a, uh, for any of these, having uh, something that says, okay, here's how we're going to, um, you know, add Geo on top of uh, one of these is a great way. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I could see that as one approach. Um, there have, um, I feel like for some of what we've done, um, it's been good to, um, um, just get an implementation out there and think about uh, and then be able to iterate uh, with it in a project uh, just to see what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. Uh, so um, that said, uh, I've also seen conversations where people have, you know, gotten on GitHub and tried to say, okay, you know, we're trying to figure out how, um, you know, uh, Arrow should be organized so that we can come up with a really good Python library for it. And um, yeah, I, th I think it's interesting to see how to organize those talks. Uh, Omar asked. Um, hey, Jim, I'm going to leave you with those questions in the chat. You can look at those yourselves and discuss them as long as you want, as I understand. So, great. Okay. 
So Omar's got a question. Yeah, so George is going to drop off because our next talk in the track is starting in five minutes. Omar's got a question about do you store the space filling curve index uh, alongside the coordinates? Um, the keys are, a lot of the keys in the GMASA tables are, uh, you know, created using um, that space filling curve uh, information. So um, we've got metadata to know which curve we used to generate those bits and bytes. And so um, that's, you know, really what gets uh, used there. So uh, we don't have to, yeah, so the coordinates are also stored in the value. So hopefully that helps there a little bit. And Anita asks uh, if, uh, if I'm working on any features specializing on movement data, like the vessel track she mentioned. Um, and uh, the answer is yes, we're always trying to uh, work on things, make them a little better. Uh, the uh, answer is also no, not as fast as I'd like. Um, there is a lot of work that could be done. Um, George's talk at the beginning mentioned the uh, moving feature uh, OGC spec. Uh, that would be a good one to implement. Um, there's also a fair bit that could be done just to, um, as you ingest uh, point data, point observation data to generate uh, higher level aggregations of the data. And so, um, yeah. Um, so Anita is also uh, very interested in this. She's got papers about uh, uh, mobility data. Uh, feel free to, Anita, if you want to, to add a link to uh, your stuff in here. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's another topic that's very interesting to me. So are there any other questions? Um, so uh, there is a Slack channel uh, for, there, there's a yeah, Slack channel for the whole uh, ApacheCon conference and there's a geospatial channel. I'll go ahead and try to get my slides over there real quick. And other than that, uh, please join us for uh, the next two talks. Uh, they'll be starting here in two or three minutes. Thanks. Um, and I'll hang out here for another minute and see if there are any other questions.